Um, so here, here's an aerial photograph taken in the 1960s. This was, um, oh, forget the guy's name. It'll come to me in a second. He was a geologist and a pilot, and he did a really wonderful book called Geology Illustrated. And a lot of his photography was, was helping to turn the tide back in the early 60s towards acceptance of a catastrophic model for the Scablands. But this is part of the cataract complex. And you can see these big horseshoe shapes here. That's very typical because when water flows, it's actually flowing faster in the center of, of the flow. And near the margins of the flow, the perimeter, it's flowing slower. Right. Because it's slowing, flowing faster in the middle, it's more erosive. And yeah. so basically what happens if you do a velocity profile, it would look like a U with the top of the U being the fastest flow. Mm -hmm. But the erosion features that it creates are the inverse of that, if that makes sense. Yeah. And that's what we're looking at here. So you can see here a couple of things. You see the eroded bedrock. And by the way, these cliffs are about 400 feet high. Um, and you notice the texture of the bedrock here. It looks like the, a, a beach that you would walk up to that was coming up with high tide. Yeah. Okay, we're going to keep going here. So you can see here's Horseshoe Falls at Niagara. Very typical cataract formation, the famous Horseshoe Falls Sure. formed because of this differential velocity profile in, in the water flow. Um, and you can see Niagara Falls is pretty impressive. I don't know if either of you guys have been there. Uh, I took a group up there back in, what was it, 2001, just so we could see and get a sense of the scale of Niagara Falls, which is pretty damn impressive. Um, and, you know, when you're there, the, the, the thunderous roar of the falls and the power, it, it just, it's mind boggling. But then, when we get to dry falls, what I've done is I've inserted a little picture up here in the left, which is scaled. So this is Niagara Falls scaled to dry falls cataract. Wow. So you'll, you'll notice that um, it's actually pretty minuscule compared to the, wow. to the ancient. Crazy. This is an extinct cataract. And this is only one cataract. Like it says here, distance across this single alcove as shown is 2,000 feet. The whole cataract complex is five miles wide. So the water, we're looking north here, the water flowed from the north and swept over. The water was estimated to be right here about 400 feet deep. So the depth of the water was about the same as the height of the cliff here. And during the peak of the flood, you wouldn't have actually even seen a waterfall. You'd just mm -hmm. seen a bump. Right, and you can see the striations there in the background too. Yeah. Oh yeah, And the yeah. fall is exactly the same shape. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Um, Here's, here's a picture from the ground, and I'll insert Niagara Falls for stage. <laughs> Get out of there, Niagara. Hey, go home, you're drunk. <laughs> Pretty impressive, isn't it? It's immensely impressive. Yes, yes. Um, and so here is just below Falls looking south down Grand Coulee. And I want to call your attention over here to the cliff faces. And you see these piles of bouldery gravel swept up on the sides. Yeah. This is not ordinary talus that falls off the cliffs and piles up. This is material that was being swept along in the waters of the flood. And when the water, uh, when the currents finally declined and settled down, it mantled the sides of the canyon that it cut and the floor with this massive amounts of debris. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah. it doesn't look chunky like it would have come off the rock face, right? No, it, yeah, exactly. It looks ground up. It looks ground up. Yeah, and here you can see it pretty clearly in this. And, and the basalt, you know, goes back to uh, episodes of, of outflow dating from about 6 million to about 17 million years ago. And you had multiple flows, and you would have a flow. It would solidify. You'd have another flow on top of it. So now you have this bedding plane separating the two flows. When, when the floods came through, a lot of times what they did was they stripped off and left the surface. And what you see here is, as it's called here, the Grand Ronde basalt. This was an earlier layer, and then there were layers on top of it that got stripped away, leaving this shelf. And then you also see what I call it the wash-up debris, the stuff that's been washed up because we're actually sort of in a curve right here and you have to picture the water kind of rushing around this curve and yeah. as it does this material is just being washed up against the sides of the cliff right and this is yeah this is at the southern end looking up and of course these cliffs here are about 900 feet high sure and 
And each of these is called a hanging valley. And what happens is whenever it rains, these become temporary waterfalls spilling sure. over. But just like with Multnomah Falls, it's the same deal. You know, the water comes through and has stripped through and created these cliffs. Because prior to that, this was a continuous layer of basalt linking the, the west side to the east side. Wow. And then when you get at the bottom end of Grand Coulee, you've got this big debris fan. It's called the Ephrata fan. And it's spread out. Um, and the approximate boundaries of this fan are in red here. Um, you can see here, there's this basin. This is the bottom end of Grand Coulee. And, wow. and you can see this texture here where all of this material spread out. And then the residual flows kind of did its final work, like the frosting on top of the cake. They did their final etching and shaping of the landscape and left this, for example, this is Moses Lake, which looked like a typical meandering river, but it's not a river, it's a lake. But that meander was like one of the last products of the declining floodwaters. And now it's a trough scoured right. out that's occupied by, by a lake. Is and that horizontal line at the bottom of that last slide where the um, where the debris co kind of collected or started to collect? This right here? Yeah. No, that is actually an anticline. What okay. I was talking about earlier. Right, where the, right. Where the basalt got compressed. But when you sit, actually, and I don't know if I've got this slide here, but yeah, the, wa the, the you picture a tsunami loaded with debris and it washed up and basically washed against this pre-existing anticline. Yeah. And so all along the base of this anticline, you've got huge masses of, of material that got dumped there. Yeah, because I'd be interested that, you know, that would be a lot of evidence that would be collected there because of the resistance. And it's kind of like washed up on shore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah, and yes. Analyze. Now, the, the elevation difference, this is called Babcock Ridge over here. And the elevation difference between the ridge and this area here, which is called Drumheller Channels, is 400 feet. Okay. Now, Drumheller Channels was the main outlet for the water. This is nine miles wide. Now, you wow. got a picture right there. You've got a river nine miles wide, right. 400 feet deep. Jeez. But even that flow was so great that this nine mile wide uh, depression here couldn't handle all the water and it backed up and filled this whole basin here called Quincy Basin and it spilled over Babcock Ridge in three places and these are huge extinct cataract complexes on the scale of dry falls that we just looked at where the water spilled over and had created these tremendous temporary waterfalls of water flowing down into the Columbia uh, Gorge there. Here we over here we see the southern terminus of Moses Cooley, where it comes down and meets the Columbia right here. And this is an amazing location right here because you've got two gigantic flood currents coming together. And that's what created this pointed topography right here. Right. But when you get down into this debris fan here, which covers this whole area, it's more than a thousand square miles, several hundred feet deep of this stuff. Wow. This is the whole Ephrata debris fan. And when you look at this, it's in most of it's basalt, this dark stuff, but scattered in there is pink granite whose source is up in the Canadian Rockies, which is one of the reasons that I say, no, we have to look at something beyond just a proglacial lake in, in Missoula. Yeah. There's, there's tons of this evidence that that's contradicts the prevailing model. Yeah. This pink granite right here is one of, one of them. But yeah, when you, when you, um, Let's see, let's find, yeah. So this is looking at the debris fan. And let's see, you can barely see, I think there's a person out right here on this rock, sitting on that rock. Let's go here. This is an aerial view. These large, this is from about 2,500 feet up. These large boulders here are basically the size of houses. <laughs> Heck of this a is, fodder for your dirt clod war. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, that's uh, that's Grand Coulee. Okay, check this out. Now, this is uh, this is Upper and Lower Moses Coulee, and you can see here. Look at the texture of the of the bedrock here, and and what's interesting is you see stuff like this. Uh, let's see, 
Let me back up. I think I've got it here. Do I have it? Uh, I got pictures of Martian landscapes that look almost exactly the same because you know there were gigantic floods on on Mars as well. Sure. But um, let's go through here. So yeah, here's that V. So here was you had maybe 350 million cubic uh, feet per second coming down here, meeting at least that much water coming down this way. And when, yeah, so those arrows there show the water flow. And all of this is debris. When, when that water from Moses Coulee hit the Columbia, basically all that material spread out in both directions and created this massive debris fan that's similar to what we were just seeing. Here it is from the air. And so the Columbia is coming this way. We're looking up Moses Coulee here. These are 900 foot cliffs. There's probably 200 to 300 feet of gravel filling the bottom of the coulee. So it's really going to be closer to 1,200 feet deep once you, if you were to clean out the gravel. And here you can see the Columbia River, the present Columbia River. We're looking up Moses Coulee. And here you can see this huge debris fan splayed out from the mouth of Moses Coulee that now, you know, you can look at the scale of the thing. Here's, here's a uh, railroad down here. There's a highway. You know, this, this debris fan here is at least 300 to 400 feet thick. Yeah. So this is the stuff that was swept out. And the flow that came off the ice sheet was so great that it just, it, it, the existing pre-flood topography was just overwhelmed. And, and the new flows didn't follow the old terrain. It just cut right across the new terrain. Um, wow. Yeah, see, here, these, are, these are cliffs wow. that have just been sheared off. And the amount of energy that's required to do that. I mean, you, you know, we're talking about water, which doesn't compress, um, but it's mm -hmm. pretty malleable. I mean, it takes the shape of the container that it's within and, you know, it'll move and it'll, it'll find the path of least resistance. But when you talk about the, the amount of power that's required to shear off multiple mountain faces and just push its way through right. an area, you're talking about... Uh, you know, immense amounts of energy. Oh, tremendous amounts. And that's the thing that I keep trying to say. Until you've spent some time out in the field, you, it, it's very difficult to wrap your head around it because it's, it's on such a scale. But now what I've been doing, and, and I've got future trips planned, is I've been basically documenting the entire southern margin of the ice complex from east to west. And all the way along there, you find evidence of these gigantic floods. The Mississippi was, was overwhelmed uh, by massive floods. Um, in fact, every river valley that headed upon the ice sheets carried these tremendously augmented current flows. And uh, mostly the modern river valleys, geologists have a term, they call them underfit rivers, which is that the modern rivers are minuscule compared to the valleys that they're flowing in. And this is an example of you know, the um, modern rivers following the ancient channels that were cut by these catastrophic floods. Wow. And let's see, I should have a good picture here of... I, tell I you think what, you need more slides. <laughs> you don't have enough slides. Yeah, I need more slides. <laughs> yeah. Okay, now here is an example of, a, of, a, of an erratic. Now, basalt if it was being rolled and tumbled in the water, it would quickly break up right, right? And, and, and create these piles of debris. Uh, if it was carried in, in the ice itself, it would tend to be uh, broken up eventually. What we have here is erratics that were rafted aboard icebergs. And those icebergs are being swept along in the flood currents. And if you look at this picture, um, you'll notice that there are erratic boulders strewn across the hillsides here, right? Yeah. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is I've, I, I photoshopped out the people that, that, that were in this picture and I'm going to put them back in so you can get a sense of the scale that we're talking about here. Oh my God. Wow. This is cheese. <clears throat> yeah. Here's, here's another one. This, the, now this is 400 feet above the modern river. 
So this yeah. tells you that right here, the water was at least this high. Right. It was carrying an iceberg. And on this iceberg is this huge erratic boulder. Right. When the water settles down. The icebergs come to ground. And then they melt away. And as they melt away, they leave their cargo of gigantic boulders strewn across the landscape. Right. Is that Graham Hancock on top of that rock? No, that's actually my buddy, uh, okay. Brad Young, who I've been working with for about 23 or 24 years now. But I do have, let's see. Well, actually, this is not Graham, but I have this same, bas I took Graham to this basalt uh, erratic right here, which I call the Wenatchee erratic. And it's, it's also 400 feet above the modern Columbia. So it's on a ridge on a hillside. And so what happened was this, this boulder was being transported aboard this iceberg. The iceberg came to ground on this ridge. The iceberg melted away and left this massive rock. So, you know, you got a picture now, what size of an iceberg would it take to float a rock like this? Yeah. And then you got to imagine, okay, what kind of a current flow necessary to float that iceberg and transport it right yeah the energy level is just unfathomable Un unfathomable and when you when you travel across the landscape you begin to see these things like this is called the uh, jaeger rock and it just sits by the side of the road and you can get a sense of how big it is and there are thousands of these things strewn over the landscape they just look so out of place yeah they are out of place that's why they're called erratics <laughs> but you see, this is south of the ice sheet. So this was not deposited directly by the glacier. This was a, a, a secondary consequence of the floods. So chunks of, chunks of the glacier broke off, flooded in the river that yes. had the rocks? Okay, okay. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, and, and you notice this mound of debris. The thing is, is that these glaciers are not clean ice. They're dirty ice. So if you break up the glacier. The only ice I like. A lot of melt water. <laughs> The glacier is swept along. The glacier comes to ground. When it melts, it leaves a pile of debris that was all material that was entrained within the ice itself. Yeah. This is called a berg mound. And, and that's one of the ways we can identify iceberg rafted erratics because, see, this one is sitting in a berg mound. So this was on top of the iceberg, and this stuff was within the iceberg. Yeah. That's then, amazing. Here, here's an old uh, a graphic from a 19th century geology textbook that I found. It really does depict what the process would have looked like. Oh, yeah. That's mm -hmm. cool. Yeah, isn't that cool? And really who, drew, who drew that? That was uh, Ed, Edvard Rial, who was mainly known for being the illustrator of all Jules Verne's books. Huh. Yeah. But he did the illustrations for this particular um, – book called the world before the deluge very interesting book wow notice 1866 this was before gradualism took over right <laughs> and yet you can see here this is far more accurate and realistic depiction of what happened right here in 1866 you know what i think we need to just erase the entire 20th century from our history and just call it a mistake it's like the terrible twos of our of our consciousness <laughs> i like that